appreciate the opportunity to be with you this evening. Thank you for making time in your schedule to come and to open up God's Word and study with us. If you have any questions about anything that I have seen tonight, feel free to ask me after service. I'd love to do nothing more than to sit and open up God's Word and study it with you. But thank you so much for being here this evening. It may seem like a strange place to start, uh, but this evening we want to talk about the identity and the nature of the Church of Christ. And I realize the Old Testament is a strange place uh, to start in that study. Uh, I think you'll see why, though, in, in just a few moments. But per, perhaps you have felt, if you are a member here, perhaps you have felt in times past, especially in the culture in which we live, that being a member of a church of Christ is almost sort of a marginalized thing, right? I can remember reading a, a news article back when I first moved to Longview in 2008, uh, about something notable in the community that had happened at a Church of Christ. And I did the dangerous thing on an internet article. I started reading the comments, right? Never read the comments in an internet article, right? Started reading them, and the person said, well, that, that's a Church of Christ, and they're only known for two things, no instrumental music and no dancing, right? And perhaps that's how the religious world views the local Church of Christ that's down the road from in their community, whatever. I think most of us in here tonight realize there's a whole lot more nuance to a local church of Christ and to the idea of the church of Christ uh, than how our individual communities uh, may view it. And so tonight I want us to open up our Bibles and just kind of dig in for the time that we have tonight and to see what the Lord would tell us in His Word about the church of Christ what we need to know about it. And maybe you're here tonight and you're not a part of any church. Maybe you're trying to find one. Maybe you're trying to find the truth. I want you to open up your Bible study along with us too. We want to be what God wants us to be. And part of that is going to involve our relationship with one another in a local church. And part of that is going to involve our relationship at large with Jesus Christ. And both of those concepts are bound up in this topic tonight. So what is the Church of Christ? This is going to be an exceptionally simple outline tonight. We're looking at three big words. First of them is Christ. You can probably guess what the other two are, but uh, if you can't, hold on and we'll get there in just a second. But let's start here with Christ. Uh, th th this is not going to be anything earth-shattering tonight. Uh, th this is not necessarily laying down new ground or anything like that. But this needs to serve as a reminder to some of us about who we are and what we are to be. And I think this also serves as a way for us to be able to study with our friends, with our community members that are around us, who no doubt have some deep misconceptions about who we are and what we try to be. When my uh, best friend from my senior year in high school found out that I went to a church of Christ, his first response was, this is before we became really good friends. This might have been what led to it. He said, oh, you were the guys with the snakes at church, right? I said, no, that's not us, and that's over in Tennessee. That's not even here in Arkansas. The community doesn't understand us sometimes, do they? Sometimes that's the fault of the community. Sometimes could it be that we haven't done a good enough job of presenting ourselves? And I'm not saying, I'm not accusing that, I'm just asking, could that be the case sometimes? Let's think here, the church of Christ, let's talk about Christ. What we see with this term Christ is that this is a description, this is a title of Jesus himself. It is translated as the, the anointed, if we wanted to bring it over literally. It's related to the Hebrew term Messiah. Generally, the Hebrew term Messiah and the Greek term in the New Testament, Christ, uh, those are basically equivalent terms. But what does that mean to us? What significance does that carry for us? Well, in the Old Testament, as we're tying into that Old Testament word Messiah, or the anointed one, 
Those who operated in God's service under the law of Moses were often anointed with oil prior to their service. I want you to look at three passages in the Old Testament with me. We're going to go in order. First one's here in, in Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 30. The instructions for Aaron and his sons as they are serving as priests. Verse 30, you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister to me as priests. So before Aaron and his sons served as priests, and you remember specifically about Aaron and his sons, those were the ones who were qualified to serve as high priest, right? So before they served in that capacity, what had to first happen? Before they were priests, they were anointed. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and over here into verse 13. This is right before we get to the story of David and Goliath. Uh, this is where Samuel has gone out to anoint uh, the son of Jesse who is going to be the next king over Israel. Remember Jesse's sons are paraded before him. Uh, surely this is the Lord's anointed. And, and what's the counsel? Remember that God gives to Samuel. Don't look on his outward appearance. God does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. We remember that passage from 1 Samuel chapter 16. But over here in verse 12, all of the sons of Jesse have paraded before Samuel. The Lord indicates it's none of these. And so Samuel's left to ask Jesse, the dad, do, do you have another son? Because the Lord has said it's none of these. He's, well, I've got one more. I've got my youngest son, and he, he's out there with the sheep. Well, bring him. And so here comes David. He was ruddy, verse 12, with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. The Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is he. Arise and anoint him. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramah. So here we, we first in Exodus 30 had a priest who's anointed before he does the work as a priest. Here we've got a king being anointed before he does the work of a king. Look at Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Just a passing reference here, but Isaiah 61 and verse 1, this is actually going to be a passage Jesus takes and makes an explicit application to himself. But Isaiah 61 and verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has what? Because the Lord has anointed me. To do what? To bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. That's the work of a prophet. Prophets, priests, kings, all were anointed before going on and serving God in those specific capacities. Now flip over in your New Testaments to the book of Matthew. Come with me to the first book of the New Testament. I want you to look at the first chapter of the New Testament and the first verse of the New Testament. We transition from the Old Testament, leaving the law of Moses behind. We're coming here to the New Testament, leaving Hebrew behind, coming into Greek. So we've, we've, we're exchanging the Hebrew word Messiah for what word? Our Greek word Christ. Prophets, priests, kings, all anointed before they served in God's service in those specific areas. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, we're introduced now to the genealogy of Jesus Christ, of Jesus the Messiah, of Jesus the anointed, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That Jesus was going to be identified as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the anointed, uh, is actually an element of Old Testament prophecy in Psalm 2 and verse 2. Uh, the nations rage against the Lord and against His Christ, the Lord and His anointed. Psalm 2 and verse 2 says, or we have references in Daniel chapter 9 verses 25 and 26 to Messiah the Prince, the Messiah, the anointed one, if we're in Greek, the Christ. Both of those passages looking forward 
to Jesus. We come into the New Testament, and like we see there in Matthew chapter 1, here is this term Messiah that had been prophesied about Jesus, and now it's given to him. That is how he is identified to us in the very first verse of the New Testament. He is the Christ. He is the anointed. He is the Messiah and everything that came with that in the Old Testament. Do you think there's some call back here to the idea of prophet and priest and king? This is who the Jews should have been looking for. And that's how we're introduced to him immediately. That word Christ is going to be used 526 times in the New Testament. And every time that word is used in the New Testament, it is used exclusively with reference to Jesus. He is the son of Abraham. He's the son of David. In Matthew 16, he is the son of God. So when we're talking about the church of Christ, when we're looking at this word Christ... We're looking at the identity of someone. We're looking at the son of David, the son of Abraham. We're looking for someone with a Jewish lineage. We're looking for someone who is serving God. But as we look there at Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16, we're not simply looking for someone with a Jewish lineage. We're looking for someone. Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. We're looking for someone who himself is God. John's going to tell us, right? John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, dwelt among us, we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When we're talking about Christ, we're talking about Jesus, Son of Man, Son of God. But look at Galatians 2. Galatians 2. We're looking at Jesus the Savior. And the Jesus who saves us through his death. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. And there's a larger argument that Paul is making here, but notice that Paul identifies Jesus as the Christ with Jesus being the Savior by means of his death. When we're looking at the Christ, when we're searching for the Christ, we're looking for Jesus, we're looking for the Son of God, we're looking for a Jewish lineage, we're looking for a Savior who dies, who fulfills all of these Old Testament prophecies. Who's the prophet, who's the priest, who's the king? When we're talking about Christ, when we seek to identify ourselves as a local church of Christ, when we talk about being members of the larger church of Christ, the body of Christ, this is what we're talking about. This is what we should be talking about. This is who we're serving. This is who brings us together. This is who makes life worth living. Let's examine this word the word church. What does this mean? It's a translation of a Greek word. Literally seems to mean the called out ones. Ones who are called out of something to something else, to form something else in some different way. But they're no longer what they were, now they're something different. They're no longer where they were, now they're somewhere different. We've been called out of something and into something else. Look at Matthew chapter 16. We looked, at, we looked at what Peter confessed about Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, but let's read on from that. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 15, Jesus has posed the question, who do men say that I am? And the disciples had given a bunch of different answers as to what other people said. 
Jesus makes the pointed question, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered there in verse 16 that we read earlier, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now pick up with me in verse 17. Jesus answered and said to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The gates of Hades will not overpower it. Look over at Matthew chapter 18 and verse 17. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 17. Here's another instance of this word in the New Testament. Jesus talking about how we handle a brother back in verse 15 who sins, and we're going to him once, we're going to him twice, and in verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if he refuses even to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. We're talking about the called out ones here, the church, how they function, what they do. Acts chapter 5, verse 11 we're going somewhere with this, I promise. Acts chapter 5 and verse 11. Upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to hear the church. Acts chapter 5 and verse 11. Then great fear came upon the whole church and upon all those who heard these things talking about what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. Here's, here's what I want you to take away from those three passages. And we're talking about the church in the New Testament. The ecclesia, the called out ones. It is always, 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 without fail, a reference to people. When we see that word church, in our New Testament, it is always a reference to people. What is the church? Called out. We're not talking about a building. We're not talking about a structure, an edifice. We're talking about people. Great fear came upon the called out ones in Acts 5 and verse 11. Or in Acts, uh, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 17. If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the called out ones. And if he refuses to hear even the called out ones, let him be to you as a Gentile the tax collector but here, here's where we we need to make sure we we understand something there are primarily and, and mainly two distinct senses in which this word church is used in the new testament look at ephesians chapter one with me ephesians chapter one and i think we can i think we can make our point here from the book of ephesus book of ephesians pretty quickly ephesians chapter one Look at the very last couple of verses of Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And let's look here at verse 20. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20. Which he, that is God the Father, brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come, and he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the what? To the church, keep reading next verse, which is his body. The church, called out ones, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, flip over for just one quick moment to chapter 4. Look at chapter 4 and verse 4. As Paul gives this great message on unity in Ephesians chapter 4, look at chapter 4 and verse 4. He, he gives these seven ones, right? The very first one, there is one what? There is one body there is one body 
Come back to Ephesians 1. He put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. How many bodies are there? Chapter 4, verse 4. There is one body. Two distinct senses in which this term church is used in the New Testament. There is this, this, what we might call the universal sense, which is all of those who were added to the body of Christ by responding to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Acts chapter 2, the Lord was adding to the church daily those who were being what? Those who were being saved. Added to the church, added to the body. This is where sometimes when we're discussing these matters with our friends, with our community members, we, we can sometimes be ships passing in the night because sometimes we're using church in our conversations in all sorts of different senses. Here's one way in which I think nearly all of us as Bible believers can find some sort of agreement. I think we'd all agree we need to be in Christ. In this sense, we all got to be in Jesus. There is one body. Paul's not saying in Ephesians 4 and verse 4 that there is one local church. If he is, we've got a problem because we've got Thessalonica and Jerusalem and Ephesus and Colossae and a whole bunch of other ones. Paul's talking about the idea is there is one body of called out ones. There is one body of Christ. And that body is accurately called what? The church. So there are times in which this, this term church is used to describe all of those who have been added to the body of Christ by their response, by their positive response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when we're talking about this body in a universal sense, the church in a universal sense, look at chapter 5 in Ephesians. Then we're talking about a, a body that really has no formal structure at all. When you think about the church in its universal sense, there is no formal structure to it at all except to say one thing, and that is Jesus is the head. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23 for the husband is the head of the wife, even also as Christ is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Do you notice how many times in Ephesians, Paul is making sure we understand that the body and the church is language that goes hand in hand? We're looking at the church in its universal sense. The body of Christ in its universal sense. Jesus is the head of it. He is head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. There's no formal structure given to this body except that Jesus is the head of it. But then, what can sometimes make the going difficult as we're studying our Bibles is that this same term can also be used in a more restricted sense to refer to Christians in specific areas who have joined together for the purpose of work and service and worship. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and we can can identify this here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 18. Uh, Paul is talking to the Corinthians about some of the problems that were in their midst. And one of those problems was how they were observing the Lord's Supper and how they were treating each other in their observance of the Lord's Supper. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 18, he says this, In the first place, when you come together as a what? When you come together as a church, when you, you who? When you Corinthians come together as a church. He's not talking about the universal church here. That wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. Couldn't fit that context. 
He's talking about the church in a more restrictive sense, in a local sense. Let me show it to you again from the book of 1 Corinthians. Look at chapter 16. Look at chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and look at verse 1. Paul giving instructions to the church at Corinth. He says this to them, concerning the collection for the saints, as I gave orders to the what? To the churches, plural, of Galatia. Now this certainly can't be used in the universal sense because it's in the plural. And we've already established, Paul has been very clear about that, how many bodies are there? How many bodies of Christ are there in that sense? There's one. There is one body. Ephesians 4 and verse 4. He's talking here about local churches. Local churches in that province of Galatia. And how this local church at Corinth was supposed to relate to them. And if that's not enough, come to the end of chapter 16. And in verse 19, where it says, The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. There's a geographic description. The church that is in their house. Called out people in a specific area who have joined together to worship and serve and work together. That's how this word church is used here. And when we're talking then about the local church, this is a little bit different, admittedly, than the universal church. Jesus is still the head of it. But when you're talking about individual local churches, there is some formalized structure to them. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. I think this might be the passage that illustrates this most succinctly. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse 1, Peter's going to talk about his work being a shepherd, a pastor, an elder of a local church. He says, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder, and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. Verse 2, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Again, here's this idea of a local body of believers. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, not under compulsion but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain but with eagerness, not as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but being an example to the flock. Now notice verse 4. He's writing to whom? He's writing to elders, to pastors, to shepherds. And reminding them about what their responsibilities are in the local church that they oversee. But Notice verse 4. We're getting an idea of the structure of a local church that ideally it has who overseeing it. Shepherds, these qualified men he's talked about. But it doesn't stop there, verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Who's the chief shepherd? Who's the chief shepherd over these shepherds who are watching over their flock? That's Jesus, isn't it? Whether you're talking about the church in the universal sense or whether you're talking about the church in the local sense, who's the head? The head is Jesus. I want you to stop for just a minute and think with me. We haven't mentioned the word denomination once tonight, have we? And that's for a good reason. I don't want to talk about that tonight because I think the practical experience of denominationalism is that it runs counter to God's plan that we've seen in just these few passages and the few moments we've had together tonight. Does God want people to be together? Yes. Does God want people to be unified? Yes. Does God want people to be called out into the same body and to work and worship and serve together? 
The answer is yes. How was that accomplished? We're starting to see it right here, aren't we? But there's that other little word, right? That word of. You knew where I was going here, right? Yeah. Didn't take a rocket scientist, I know. Christ, church, of. Little word, but an important word. The word of. In English, that's a preposition. We're not all Phil here. Some of us have to be reminded what a preposition is. And so for those of you like me who need to be reminded what a preposition is, here's what a preposition is. I got this, uh, Phil dictated this to me word for word earlier. Uh, A preposition is a word governing and usually preceding a noun or a pronoun and expressing a relation to another word or element in the clause. As in the man on the platform, on would be our preposition. She arrived after dinner, after being our preposition. The word of here, in in that phrase, the church of Christ, or if we're going to be with the biblical phrase, the churches of Christ in Romans 16, it's a preposition. It expresses a relationship between the noun, a pronoun, and that next idea in that clause. In the particular phrase that we're concerned with, the church of Christ of expresses a relationship between two nouns. Church, called out ones, and Christ, Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. It expresses some sort of relationship between those two nouns. And when you define the word of in that sense, this is not filled, this is the Apple Dictionary, of indicates an association between two entities, typically of one belonging to another. I want you to put outside of your head everything that we hear in the community, everything that we hear in the religious world about the church of Christ. Break it down like we have done tonight. What is the church of Christ? It is the called out people that belong to Jesus. If we can't get behind that, I don't know what we can get behind. The people who have been called out of the world that belong to Jesus. That's the church of Christ. It is the church of Christ because it belongs to him it's not the church of Christ because there's no instrumental music it's not the church of Christ because there's no dancing or no drinking or no smoking or take your pick of what the world wants to say the church of Christ is and I'm not necessarily saying they're wrong on some of those things okay We're missing the forest for the trees if we're allowing, listen, if we're allowing the world to define for us who we are as Christians and who we are as a local church and simply in the sense we're talking about right here in the body of Christ. I want you to notice two implications with me. Here's the so what of the sermon, right? Oh, I've got to get the so what. Here's the so what. Two implications of the church of Christ and why that's direly, absolutely important. Number one, it's important to be in the church of Christ because Jesus is the Savior of the body. We just read that in Ephesians 5, didn't we? Go back there, Ephesians chapter 5. When he's talking there about husbands and wives and he tells us at the end of Ephesians 5, I've talked about husbands and wives, but really I'm talking about Christ and the church. 
For as the husband is the head of the wife, this is Ephesians 5 and 23, even so Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Because he is the head of the church, he is the Savior of the body. Because he is the Savior of the body, he is the head of the church. And we saw in Ephesians 4, there's only one body, folks. This makes identifying his church a priority. We can't just skate by on, well, good enough for grandma and grandpa, good enough for me. This is what mom and daddy raised me as. This is what I'm going to be. This is where I've always gone. This is where I'm always going to be. That can't work. We are talking about something that is vitally important to our lives and to our eternal destiny. I've got to identify his church. And we're not talking about a local sense right now. We've got to identify his church. We've got to find his body. Because that's the only way that we're going to be saved. In that sense, we've got to find the church of Christ. We've got to find that body of believers that belong to him. But that's important too. He's the head of the church. He's the savior of the body. He's the head of the church. That's going to mean the church is subject to him. In fact, that's the very next phrase that Paul writes, isn't it? Chapter 5 and verse 24. But as the church is subject to Christ. We're trying to find that body of Christ. We're trying to find that body of Jesus that he saves. It's a body that has submitted to him. People that have submitted to him. The universal church is subject to Christ. That's what the universal church is. The church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. But as you look at Ephesians chapter 4, let me submit to you that just because this is a reality for the universal church doesn't mean that the local church is accepted from this. Because this is exactly what we are called to be and how we are to be in the local church. That Jesus is just as much the head of the local church and that means we in the local church, we as a local church, are to be submissive to Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 14, as a result we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness and deceitful skimming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, Him who is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by whatever joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. We have no practical experience with the universal church except within the local church. Remember, there's no formal structure to the universal church. Our practical, our practical engagement with the universal church is in the local church. So Paul uses this body language here, in verse 16, it's about that local church in Ephesus. We see it used elsewhere in the New Testament to reference a local church as well. From whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies. Growing up, verse 15 in all aspects, into him who is the head, even Christ. A church, a local church, that's subject to Jesus. Is that where I am? I don't know where you go to church. But I know what your church needs to look like. It needs to look like it's submissive to Jesus. It needs to do what Jesus wants. So we look at a church of Christ. We're gonna, don't get worried. We're going to fly through this. This is our last chart, okay? 
I know you're tired. We're going to fly through, all right? Look at Ephesians chapter 3. We're just going to stick in Ephesians 3. I'm going to try to do this in five minutes. You turn fast and listen fast, and I'll speak fast, okay? Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Just look at this very, very practically. Ephesians chapter 3. So what is a church of Christ? It's a church that's learning and growing. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 3. That by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his apostles and prophets in the Spirit. I wrote by revelation so that you could read and what? Understand. What is a church that belongs to Christ? It's a church that is learning and growing. We're talking in the local sense right now. What is a church of Christ? It is a church that is learning and and growing but that's not all a church of christ is a church that's open to anyone look at ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6 talking about this mystery that was not made known in past generations but's now been revealed it's this verse 6 that the gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the same body and fellow partakers of the promise in christ jesus which is in the gospel It seems that with all of these New Testament epistles, in the back of it, there is always this problem with the Jews and the Gentiles getting along. And oftentimes it seems to be Christians of a Jewish persuasion who are trying to shut out the Gentiles who are coming to Jesus. And Paul here is arguing that shouldn't ever be the case. Because God's plan all along has been for Jew and Gentile to be together in one body. And I don't know about you, but the the way that the Bible seems to be structured when it comes to Jews and Gentiles is it's two circles, two segments of humanity, and everybody fits in one or the other. You were either a Jew or you were not, and if you were not, you were a Gentile. Who's left out of this equation? The answer, nobody. If the body of Christ is open to Jew and Gentile, that means the body of Christ is open to whom? everybody and so as he is taking that principle he writes now to a local church what is this saying to the local church local church is open to anyone well don't don't we need to make that a little bit clearer yes we do let's refine that down a little bit a church that is open to anyone coming to jesus christ isn't that what the text said there in verse six gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body fellow partakers of the promise that is what in christ jesus This is a church that is open to anyone coming to Jesus. But we can refine that down a little bit more. Because someone says, well, well, I have come to Jesus. I came to Jesus in the way that I think is best. Hey, I'm glad. I'm glad we're trying to come to Jesus. But I don't want to come to Jesus in the way you think is best. Nor do I want you to come to Jesus in the way that I think is best. I want us to come to Jesus the way that He wants us to come to Him. A church that is open to anyone coming to Jesus Christ through the gospel, that's what verse 6 says. The Gentiles should be fellow heirs, fellow members of the same body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. we're going to be a church of Christ if we're going to try to be the people that belong to Jesus it's going to mean opening up our Bibles finding the will of Jesus and doing it a church of Christ is a church that is active in sharing the gospel look at verses 7 and 8 This gospel, Paul says, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of His power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to Gentiles, to preach to Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. What is a church of Christ? It's a church that is active in sharing the gospel. It's a church that reveals God's wisdom. Verse 10 in order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. 
if we have more time, we don't, so don't get worried. I think Paul's point here goes right back up here to verse 6 about Gentiles, and he's talking here about the body of Christ in its universal sense, the church of Christ in its universal sense, Jew and Gentile in that same body. But we said our practical experience with the universal church is in the local church, right? Our local churches need to reveal and reflect God's wisdom. God's wisdom that we accept anyone who has come to Jesus Christ through the gospel would be the point for us. Or that our church reveals God's wisdom in any other way in which God reveals himself. Which, coincidentally, leads to our next point. That the church of Christ is a church that reveals God's wisdom because the church of Christ is a church that is rooted in God's wisdom. Verse 9. To bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things in order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. And just in case you missed the point there, a church which is rooted in God's wisdom. Did you catch the terms we just read? Heard and revelation and wrote and referring and read and revealed and minister and preach. What is a church that is rooted in God's wisdom? It is a church that is rooted in what? The gospel. This is why it's important. This is why it's important that we open up our Bibles. And we find out what God's will is. And we do it. It's not about denominational superiority. Put that aside. We're not talking about that. I don't want to deal with that. It's about finding the will of God and doing it. It's about being a called out group of people that belong to Jesus. This is what a called out group of people that belong to Jesus look like. One last one for you, very end of the chapter, verse 21. Leland, you can get ready. Here it is, verse 21. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forevermore. Amen. What is a church of Christ? It is a church of that glorifies God. I may want the church to be X. Might want it to be Y. Might want it to be Z. I might want it to have instrumental music because I think instrumental music is pretty. I might want it to have instrumental music because that's going to keep us all on beat together. It's kind of hard to fight against a piano, isn't it? Right? I've known some women who are pretty dynamic speakers. Maybe, maybe it, I'd, I'd want it to have women preachers. Maybe I'd, maybe I'd want it to have a kitchen. Maybe I'd want it to put up a big screen TV when the World Cup rolls around every four years and watch soccer again, right? Take your pick. But you know what would be the problem with that? It's not his church anymore. That's my church. It doesn't need to be my church. I don't have the wisdom he has. I don't have the power he has. I don't have the insight he has. And I can't save like he saves. It doesn't need to be my church. It needs to be his church. And that's what it's about. Finding his will. And doing it in our lives as individuals. In our lives as a church. You have been gracious tonight. I appreciate it. That is a lot of material. You stayed awake, so kudos to you for that. I appreciate it. If you look at your life tonight, and you haven't been living as you should, and you want to make a change, we don't want to end a service like this without offering you the opportunity to do that. Maybe as you look at your life, you are outside of the body of Christ. Maybe you've never come to Jesus Christ to be saved, but you want to change that tonight. We want to help you make that change, and we're ready to help you make that change.
The Lord was adding to the church daily those who were being saved in Acts 2. What did they do to be saved? They asked that very question. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What did Peter say? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you're ready to do that tonight, we're ready to help you. If you'd simply come while we stand and while we sing.